worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. Shout out your praise, joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out. slaves to everything that's going on around us, Lord. We thank you that you love us. We are no longer a slave to fear, Lord. We just thank you that fear has to go right now. You are no longer afraid. Don't let fear take over your life. Don't let fear take over your life. He is with you. He is beside you. He is never 
never left you. And I just thank you for that.
as we love our children, how much more does he love you? Imagine that. Imagine that.
that we confess it that you are great and you're great towards us you're great to the ungrateful you're good to the ungrateful you're good to the grateful you're perfect Lord thank you Lord I was just thinking of the, the verses in here and I just want to pray specifically for anybody here and, and it's the first verse is you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness and this is what really struck me is you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. And I just want to right now pray for anybody here. Let's just let's just close our eyes right now, and just in a moment of uh, uh, because I, you know it's, uh, it's 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 like a private thing. I want to specifically pray for people. You've got a broken heart. You know things have happened. It wasn't God's will, but it happened. But he wants to restore that which is broken. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus came and he's, and we're going to use this verse later on when I'm preaching. But he says that he came to heal the broken hearted. The spirit of the Lord was upon him and he said, this has been fulfilled today. 
that prophecy in Isaiah that he came to heal the broken heart. If that's you, just raise your hand and say, man, you know, Pastor, I have that. And, I, I, you know, I've got hurt. I've got pain. I've got a broken heart. You know, there's nothing to be ashamed in that. Okay, there is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of that. In fact, that's what Jesus came for. He came to heal the broken heart. Father, as you see, okay, you can, you can lower your hand. Father, you see those hands. Lord, I thank you that you're healing them, whether they feel it or not. But it will manifest, Lord. And you will show them, Lord. Lord, I thank you right now. Heal the heart that is broken. Heal that heart. Uh, cover up that, uh, cover over that wound, Lord, with the, the, the salve of your Holy Spirit. And, and man, Lord, where there's tearing, where there's been, where there's a, a, been a, a, like a piercing or a cutting, Lord, that you, you, you touch that and you heal that. that. That scar may be there. Your scars are still on you, but you're whole. And you came to give us wholeness in our spirit and our soul and our body. So I thank you right now, Lord. Touch these. Touch these. Heal these. In the mighty name of Jesus, by your precious Holy Spirit. We call it done. In Jesus' name and all the people said, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your holy written word. We thank you, Lord, that we have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord says. We thank you, Lord, that... We are not just hearers today, but we're doers, and the doer is blessed. Thank you, Lord, that will that let this word really penetrate our hearts, Lord, and really see the goodness and the love that you have for us that was displayed on the cross in Jesus' name. And everyone say it. All right. Psalm 8, verse 1. Oh, Lord, our Lord. This is David. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. You see that explanation point there. It fills the whole, that fills the earth. Your glory is higher than the heavens. Now, remember when Mike was talking last week about all the billions of stars and all of that? And here's David as a, as a shepherd boy, and he's, he's out there in the field, and he's just looking up. Now, you can imagine what it looked like. The only way you can see what David saw is you got to get away from this city. you got to get away from the lights. And a, a couple of years ago, we went, uh, Bill Oliveira and Dion, uh, we went out in the, this is the edge of nowhere. I mean, we were out in, in down in way southeastern Oregon. I mean, a Waihi wet reservoir. I mean, it was pitch black. But it didn't get really, really dark till about 12 o'clock or so because the sun had to really get down. And the Milky Way was just, there was a cloud in the sky. It was, just, it was just amazing. And that's what David was looking at because there wasn't any ambient light then, right? There was no electricity. And so he's just looking up there, contemplating about what he's seeing. And then he, verse 3 well, let's just read the whole thing because it's awesome. Out of the mouth of, of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. That's man. And you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands to put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. I call this sermon, What is Man? What is man? See, as David was contemplating, looking out over the universe and the wonders and he wonders, why would God think, care, or even visit man? David never got to know the new birth that we know. He never got to know that. He never saw the love of Jesus or the love of God shown on the cross. But he knew that God was mindful of man. That's why he asked, why why are you mindful 
in verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? See, mindful is equal to come to remembrance. It means to continually. It means to be fixed on something. And man is the fixture in the mind of God. Mankind is a fixture in the, man, in the mind of God. It's hard to comprehend how God can be so fixed and in love with a creature such as man when you think about it. Why, Pastor Steve? Because he's rebellious. He's rebellious. No one seeks for God. God goes after us. When I was running the streets, guess what? I wasn't looking for the police. Okay? I wasn't looking for them. They were looking for me. It's the same thing with man. He knows in his heart, he knows in his conscience, he's guilty. So he started running to him, he runs from him. That's why he has to draw us to himself. Because we don't, the first thing we have to do, we have to humble ourselves and admit I am a sinner and I am lost and I need a savior. But we don't want to humble ourselves. So then he has to continually draw us. He puts people in our path. We get to church. We hear the gospel. Hopefully the church is preaching the gospel. But there's all kinds of different circumstances. I had different people come into my life trying to tell me about the Lord. But I kept running, kept running. As I told you before, I found out God's everywhere. But, I mean, man is, 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 is basically rebellious. Man is sinful. Man is his biggest problem. It's pride. It's, it's pride. That's what held me back from God for so long. I didn't want to humble myself. And so most people, and I would say generally, what, is, what was the enemy? What is Satan's problem? What was his problem? Pride. He lifted himself up above God. And so, but God, he can't shake us off. His burden is for the human race. His burden is for us. He's burdened for us. Think of it that way. It's like a nail that is driven into a hard piece of, of wood, and, he can, and you just can't pull it out with your hand. And that's like God's mind. It, it, we are fixed in his mind, stuck in there, and he can't get his mind off of us, and he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to. You know, it's kind of a strange, in a strange way, it's like a spider web. You know, I, I, you know, I get spider webs around the house, you know, and, and I don't get rid of them right away. I know it's kind of macabre, man, but I like to see, I like to see the, the fly or whatever. It hits it, you know, and the little spidey zzz, 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 you know, and he pulls a stinger zzz, you know, on the, de- you know, the fly's dead. <laughs> I don't know why, man, but it's just, I know it's kind of macabre watching this thing go on, but it's reality. And God made it that way so the spider can be fit. He takes care of the spider, all right? And, then, and I think it's a good thing because I hate flies. The more, the, the, you know, I just, sometimes I leave those spider webs up for a long time and just, you know, keep eating them bugs, man. I like it. But God, yeah, do your job. But in a strange way, God is like that. He's entangled in this web or this, this mesh of love for mankind. God's, God's mind, God, it's like that spider web. He's, we're, we're tra- he, he, he's trapped for us. For us, he can't escape. He can't escape, and it's okay with him. He loves us that much. But, you know, it's, it's interesting that the love of a mother, which is an awesome thing to watch. I mean, I love that with, you know, with Audrey. And, but I, I watch Lindsay as a mom, you know, when she's first a mom. And I was like, you know, she's a really good mom. She's a really, really good mom. And, um, and it's just neat to see. And you're a good dad, too, Michael. Can I go you're a great dad. And that little girl, she, he is, you talk about being spun in a web. <laughs> but you know what? We're in it together. <laughs> but he can't escape. But, you know, you can relate to the love of a mother for her children, and she would never forsake them. She would never leave them. But you know what? They do. 
I've seen it and I don't understand it. My mother would do anything for us kids. And most moms I know would, they would never leave their children. But some do. And it's sad. But you know what? God never will. He says he will never leave us or forsake us. He would never do that. And this, this God will do despite man's rebellion towards him. He won't leave us despite our rebellion. In fact, believers can be, God tells them to do something, they won't do it. I know none of you, but this is talking about me. Okay, he tells me, and, and, I, and I refuse and refuse, and he keeps talking, he keeps talking. He doesn't give up on me, and finally I give in, and I'm so thankful I do because he still receives me just as I am. That rebellious guy. And so this, this is, it, it, it's, it's amazing. And then man, it, listen, man is made in God's image. And God, man is God's image. He's also man, God, a man is God's pride. You know, I'm proud of my girls. They, they've turned out great. They, they picked awesome husbands. I couldn't have picked better husbands. I personally couldn't have picked better ones. And it, I prayed them in. But God is proud of, of his creation. It's not like he looks down and he goes, Steve Hunt. What? Seriously? You're worthless. No, that's what the world says. That's what the enemy says. See, that's the things I heard. Those are things I heard that I had to get beyond and see what the Bible says about me. But God is not only proud of us, we are his responsibility. Yes. We are his responsibility. When you have children and they're young, what do you do? You just leave them to go and do what they want? No. You know what I got from my mom? <laughs> Grab whatever she could. Whack. Why? She's trying to teach me. She wants, if she, the Bible says that God loves us so that he will discipline us. Okay? He will discipline us. Now, he doesn't discipline you with sickness and disease and calamity and all that. That's not, he doesn't have to. The Bible is how he corrects us, okay? And, I mean, it's just for instance, God says, who would, who, what son or what mother or father would give a son that asked for this and give him a snake or a stone or whatever? No, no, you wouldn't do that. Well, if you wouldn't do that, how much more would God give you good things, Okay? So, going on, so just like we're responsible to raise your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, or even if you aren't, the unbelieving, they still raise their children. They know I'm responsible for this child. I mean, when you have a child, all of a sudden, my world, it's like, and you're like, uh-oh. Oh, boy. Life is really different now. And you just, you figure it out. You're like, oh, boy. Oh, boy. And then, but God, man, is also God's problem because he created him. Now, it's just like, like, like Steffi was a problem. Lindsay was perfect. No, I'm just kidding. We ought to put that right and tell the time where that is and really. And Steffi, she'll be calling me and she'll come over to the house with a switch or something. But, but no, she was awesome. She's just a little different, all right? So... She would work, but, she, but it all paid off, all right? Um, unfortunately, she was her dad more than she was her mom. There's the problem. There's the problem. Yeah. Oh, we want kids. Yeah, you want kids. To, they turn out to be like you. But though, though there, the, there is a moral problem. See, there's a moral problem, and it's ours, and it's ours alone. See, God is responsible for us, but at the same time, we are responsible as free moral agents. See, my, man is likened to a flower. He's, a, he's likened to a vapor. He's, he's, he's likened to the grass in the field. It's here and it's gone. You know, if I could look back, like, you know, so I went to my, um, 
my alma mater, uh, you know, I went to Central Catholic, right? And, uh, and I went to the football game on, on Friday afternoon. And, and we won five championships in, since, since 2011, I think, something like that. But I think, and, and there's these guys, you know, these, uh, these people were behind us. And, of course, my family's loud. And I'm there with one, one of my older brothers and my, his two sons, my nephews. And I tell you, I think the whole stadium could hear us. I mean, it was. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, these people were behind us. And they said, did you guys go to, are you graduates? And we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 he, I pointed my brother, I go, he's 66 and I'm 70 and there's one over, there's one above him and there's one between us and these are his nephews, anyway, these are his sons. And I, it, it, I just had a like, wow, 1970, that seems like, if you think about, it, it was just a little bit ago, you know, but no, it's, man, I mean, it's a long time ago, eh? that's what life is like, it goes, you know, how many of you know you turn 20, 19 or 20, and all of a sudden I'm going, what, what's going on with the calendar? <laughs> what's going on with cal- Why is it going faster? It's the same. It's 365 days. How come the days seem like 100 instead of 365? And you, you just reach that point where time just starts, and next thing you know, you're old. <laughs> like me. I'm old. You know why? You know, I used to get offended when people tell me I'm old because I've always, you know, had a, you know, young, young spirit. And, and uh, then the Bible says, and it's Proverbs 17, 7, it says, old men, uh, gra- uh, old men uh, 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 that are grandfathers or something like that. And I go, okay, I'm old. I'm a granddad. Uh, I'm old. You can call me old man. I don't care. I'm not offended because I got grandkids. But listen to this. Our life is short. It's like into a flower. It's like into a vapor. It's like into a grass of the field. What, what does that all show? The frailty of man. That's what it shows. It shows the frailty of man. Yet, this almighty creator is mindful of us. He sees our frailty. He sees all of it. And yet, his thoughts are continually on us. His mind is full of man. See, we think, why is, David said, why is it that you are mindful of man? Well, just turn it around. Why is it that you are full, your mind is full of man? Continually. See, our thoughts change from one thing to another in a split second. But not with God. He's only always thinking of us. Isn't that amazing? Think about it. I mean, I can see how God looks at our frailty. I can see how he looks at our ignorance. But how can he look on us in our sin and love us? Well, if you're a parent, you, you get it. You really get it because you see, and you don't have to be a parent. All you need to see is what God has done. You don't have to be a parent to see it. It helps. Because you, you'll, you'll, you'll love your kids through anything. My parents love me and my brother, and we put them through H-E-L-L toothpicks. You know, that's why my wife would always say, sweetie, you just said hell. Just say hell, okay? <laughs> it's not a cuss word, all right? But we did. We, we put them through torture. But they loved us in the midst of all of it. It was a beautiful picture of God's love. And, and God will love us through thick and thin. And, it, and it's amazing that man, man's daily conduct is all that we need to see that sin is destroying lives. You just look around. You know, um, I was talking to a brother today. He's working today. And uh, we sh- he showed some old picture and, of him and his, you know, growing up. And I sent him one. And, and I showed him, you know, the this picture of this buddy of mine and the guy who took the picture. And both of them died from alcoholism. Both of them did. And uh, by the, one was died right around, just, re, just right after I got saved. The other one died many years later. But, and I said, I said, the sexual revolution and the drug culture that came out of the 1960s, we're seeing the ramifications of it to this day. 
It all came out of there. There was drug use before that, and there was alcohol, but, but not on what we're seeing now. It's, it's unbelievable. Look at Portland. It's a drug problem. It's out of control. It's just out of control, and we need help. And the city needs to see that's the problem. That was my problem. And so when we look at that, we see, man, it, it, his conduct is all we need to see, that sin is what it is. That, that's what's destroying society. And history is, is, it's our own indictment. You know, man has betrayed himself, not God. Man has betrayed himself in thought, in virtue, in truth. Man has betrayed himself spiritually, philosophically, morally. God has, man has done it. It's not God. And yet many blame the very one who gave them the right to free will and life itself as the source of society's ills. It's God's problem. It's God's fault. It's just like the enemy at the garden. And he said, did God really say that? He doesn't have your best interest at heart. Did he really say that? Yes, God did say, don't eat of that. You eat of that tree? Don't eat that. Life is great. Stay away. Do you know that man only had one commandment to follow? One! One! I mean... The Jews ended up with 10 plus, right? Adam and Eve had one. This is all you got to do. Just don't, don't eat from it. I mean, how hard is that? Pretty hard because they did it. They believed the lie. And mankind is still believing the lie of the one who is the father of lies. They're still believing it. You know, A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, you know, I've mentioned him many, many times. He said this. He said, some ask, why does God let men die? Tozer said, I ask, why does God let men live? But Tozer knew why, and so do I. See, we're fixed on his mind like a nail in his heart. I heard of a man who couldn't believe that, uh, that God could love him because of what he'd done in his life. And then if you go to, and I didn't give you this. Is, is that you, Christy? Yeah. I didn't give you this, but it's in Genesis 6, 5 and 6. And I'll just read this. Genesis 6, 5 and 6. And this is before Noah. And it says... Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. You see that? God was grieved in his heart. One can only grieve when one, when you've suffered in your heart. You say, how, do you, how does that happen, Pastor Steve? See, you can suffer in your body, you can suffer in your finances, but until you've suffered in your heart, you don't know grief. You only, only when you've loved can you truly grieve. See, I told you about those friends of mine that died from, I, I had friends die from overdoses, I had friends that died from alcoholism, and I grieved. Why? Because I loved them. You know, when I lost my dad, I mean, I admired that guy so much. To this day, I still do. He was my hero. He was the greatest. I used to tell him, you're the greatest man to walk on the face of the earth next to Jesus. He goes, oh, he'd go, oh, Lord. And he was humble. He was a giver. He was generous. And I grieved. When they, when I went to the house, I was actually preaching that day here, and I got a phone call from my brother. He was in the house. He died in our house. Both of my parents died in the house I grew up in. They wouldn't leave. And, uh, and uh, I got a phone call from my oldest brother. He says, Dad's passed. And so I went home, got there, said my goodbyes, and they had him in the, you know, they put him in the hearse, and just as they go, put him in the hearse, I just lost him in front of my brothers and my sisters. 
And I just lost it. Why? A nail had pierced my heart. I was grieved. When you know that, you've lost somebody like that. Think how God saw mankind. Think of that. That's how God grieved for mankind. When they ate of that tree, he said, oh my, but I got a plan. I got a plan. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy them back. They were sold into slavery. We sang it. We were in slavery, but I'm going to buy them back. I'm going to purchase them with my son's blood. That's the ransom, and I'm going to purchase them. I'm going to buy them back. You've been bought with a price if you're a believer. Yes, you've been bought with a price with the blood of Jesus. Someone might say, well, I'm not worthy of God's love. Of course not. We're not worthy, but the truth is it's there. It's there. You can't, re- you can't just not say, well, it's not there. He doesn't love me. Oh, no, no, no. He, he loves you. See, the field doesn't say, I'm not worthy of the rain to come down on me. But the clouds come. They form. They fill up with water. And eventually it rains, not just on the field, but it rains in the street. It rains on the town. It rains in the cities. It's like Jesus said, he sends the rain where? To the what? The just and the who? The unjust. He causes the sun to shine on who? The just and the unjust. The righteous and the unrighteous. Why? Because he loves them all the same. See, we can look at people and say, I don't like that guy. Well, you cannot like him. That's emotion. That's feeling. That God's okay with you not liking somebody. But you got to love them. See, like involves feelings. Love is a commitment, first and foremost. I can get all gushy and lovey with my wife, and then there's other times it ain't there. (laughs) It's not there. In fact, we're like, and any of you seen us, you know how we can be. But you know what? We're committed. See, we're committed, and that's what God is. I'm committed to the righteous and the unrighteous, to the just and the unjust. I love them both equally, and I'll bless them both. That's the love of God. He doesn't do it because we're worthy. He does it because he's God. It's who he is, and he can't escape you. Isn't that awesome? We're a fixture in the mind of God. God isn't thinking about what's going to happen In 20 years from now, he already knows. He's not thinking what happened. That's in the past. He's fixed right now on mankind. He knows what he's going to do when he's going to do it. But what he's fixed on right now is that we love, honor, cherish, and worship him. Because why? He's worthy. See, I no nobody had to tell me, you know. Like people, in, in, get me in the right sense here. I worshiped my dad. I didn't bow down before him and do that. He wouldn't, he would have, you know. But I, in a sense, I worshiped him. Why? Because he showed me so much love. And my brothers and sisters, my dad, we, you, you know, we were, cl- we were really close to my dad. My, my mom wasn't so nurturing, you know. But, I mean, she was a great mom. Don't get me wrong. But my dad was very nurturing, okay. And he loved us kids, and he just, you know, and he ne- it was funny because he never cut us any slack, but he loved us still. You know, he loved to tease us and stuff. But, but he was just a great dad. But so I, it was easy to love him. See, people say, why does God need your worship? He doesn't need it. But we give it because he's, he's worthy. He's awesome. He's amazing. So I have no problem coming in and worshiping him. I love it. I love it. And, but we, he can't escape us. And, and then when you talk about value, now you say, well, we're not worthy. No, not necessarily. But we have value. See, the thing, anything, the value of anything is determined how much somebody will pay for it. People buy stuff and you can't figure out yeah, how, how many ever watched the, the auctions, the, the, the car auctions? Is anybody into that? 
What, what's it? Is it Meekum? What's it called? Meekum? Meekum. Meekum. And they roll these cars out. Oh, my gosh. They're some beautiful cars. And they roll this 55 Chevy out. You know, yeah. That was a hot car in high school, man. If you had a 55 Chevy, man, you know, I was a Chevy guy. Ford's okay, but, man, I love Chevys. And they'd roll this Chevy out, and they go, $100,000. And the guy's just, sold. And I go, who's got $100,000? You know, just, you know, disposable income. Why would they spend that much money? Because they value it. People pay over a million dollars for a Honus Wagner baseball card. I don't know what it's worth now. It's crazy what it's worth. It's the most expensive baseball card you can buy. Second baseman for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Pastor Steve, know anything about baseball? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> you have so much value that God sent his only begotten son to buy you back. That's what you, that's how much, were, were we worth it? Were we worthy? No, we weren't worthy, but we had value. We had value, enough that he would do that for us. See, God, this is why this is, this is why this verse is so incredible. For God so loved. God mind is so fixed on mankind. Think of it that way. God's mind is so fixed on mankind, so tangled in a web, so driven in his heart that he gave his only begotten son. Think of it that way. That's a whole new way to see John 3.16. For God so loved, his mind was so full of mankind that he gave his only begotten son. God's love is in that nail driven in his hands. God's love is that wound on his side. God's love is that blood spilled at the bottom of the cross. That's the love of God. So when you take these elements, think of that. Remember. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus said. Do this in remembrance that this is what I did for you. Because my mind is full of you. And you will take this today like maybe you've never taken it. And think about that. Because we are fixed in the mind of God. What is man? What is man? He's God's creation that he can't and won't get his mind off. Amen? Okay, we're going to take this now. So you say, Pastor Steve... Who can take communion? Well, anybody that's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been born again, you know him as your Lord and Savior, that's, a, that's if, if, you're, if you haven't done that, that's okay. It's, it's all right. But if you have, then this is for you. And so just come up and, and, and grab one. And we're going we're gonna to grab this. We're going to take the elements. And then we're going to do a song at the very end. elements
Father, we remember now as we take this wafer that represents your son's body. Jesus, we take this in remembrance of you that you came as one of us, born of a virgin, and you came and you said, even before you came, the word says that you said, give me a body that you have prepared for me. And I will go there and I will pay that ransom price to bring back your creation to you. I will pay the price so that all can have an opportunity to receive me as their Lord and Savior. So Lord, we thank you right now. We take this as a remembrance of your body that was laid on that cross, beaten, whipped, beaten in the face, struck over the head, pierced through the side and the hands and the feet, that body, we recognize it today and we remember it. In Jesus' name, let's take it. And this year, you said that at that Last Supper, you said that this wine, that wine or this juice represents the blood of the new covenant, not the old one that can only cover this removes and we thank you Lord that the blood of Jesus it forgives it restores it delivers it sets us free it makes us a son or a daughter of God and it makes us the redeemed of the Lord and today we say so that we are the redeemed of the Lord and we remember that the blood that laid at the bottom of that cross is for all who believe. Today we believe and we take and we remember the blood that was shed for us because there's nothing like the blood. In Jesus' name, let's partake. Well, I wanted to do a song and I was trying to think of this one song and I just it just escaped me. And so I said, well, I told, I told Lindsay, I said, just come, find some song that talks about the blood, you know? And then I dawned on me, you know, there's an old hymn that talks about the blood. There's an old hymn that talks about the blood. And so, here. So, why don't we stand up? We're going to sing the old hymn, Nothing But the Blood. Jeff's going to lead us in it. So let's. Let's worship the Lord and thank God for being so mindful of us in His blood. And wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus.
Thank you, Lord. All right, you are dismissed. Have an awesome week. Amen.